the sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish these things simply aren't true without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. We are besieged on all sides by people who wish to tell us what and how to think and feel, what to consume, and what to value. These cultural messages and scripts spring forth from our televisions, cell phones, radios, and social media accounts, penetrating nearly every corner of our existences. This control over our conscious lives can only be achieved through our consent, and our consent is therefore the most valuable currency of our time, and perhaps of all time. Companies pay unfathomable amounts of money to behavioral psychologists and advertising specialists whose sole job is to make content that extracts consent. It's no coincidence that the rates of disillusionment, NUI, alienation, resentment, and fear of insignificance, what I call Dear F, have skyrocketed. When content makes us feel sad, horny, happy, or motivated, it elicits a reaction and most of us have a really hard time pulling ourselves away, what I would call withdrawing consent. Consent for what, you might ask? Consent to tell you what your lived experience should be and what shape your being should adopt as you grow, mature, and move around in the world. Pulling away is particularly difficult for young adults, many of whom have lost the traditional guiders of a stable family life and community, religion, a set career path, and even institutions for meeting a romantic partner. Many of my friends have disclosed how much they cringed when graduating high school or college because the word career forced them to contemplate what a slow spiritual death via an unfulfilling job would feel like. Our lives are so interconnected and thoroughly entertained that there's simply little to no room for the individual to grow and thrive. Our politics, family life, religious views, entertainment choices, and even science are often spoon-fed by the media, whether it's by YouTube, Twitter, Netflix's movies and shows, Spotify's podcasts like Joe Rogan, Groupthink on Facebook or Reddit, TV stations and news organizations, or emergent social pressure that is woven by these companies. Many have little to no hope for escape. Humans are remarkably easy to manipulate. I don't think there's some grand sinister plot, but I do believe that large corporations have found easy ways to amass power and wealth. A range of media personalities have termed this box the matrix. How would one break out? How would you withdraw consent and liberate yourself from this prison? How do you escape the matrix? Why would you even want to escape the matrix? The point of this video is to convince you to withdraw and set yourself free, or in YouTube terms, unplug from the matrix. If my videos are successful, you'll not only stop watching them, you also stop mindlessly searching YouTube and other services for great content and instruction. You will read and interact with the books we discuss and as a result, grow as an individual. You will aggressively pursue new, exciting, and uncomfortable learning experiences, whether they're stepping outside of your social bubble, going camping, or trying to paint. You will become a happier and more well-grounded person, and you will think for yourself. To be an authentic and fulfilled human, your life needs to be based on truth. That's what we're seeking. Truth. Imagine that you're in a cave with a wide, bright entrance a long way up. You've been in this cave from your earliest memories, fixed in the same place with your limbs and neck tied down. Your friends, siblings, and parents are similarly subdued to your left and to your right, being forced to look forward because they're unable to move their heads. There's a fire above and behind you, burning to cast a glow on the wall you face. There's an upwards path between you and that fire, and on that path, a low wall has been built like this screen in front of puppeteers, above which they show their puppets. There are people behind that wall with all sorts of toys, dolls, and objects. These objects are projected onto the wall you face. Some of them talk, some of them are quiet, some won't shut up, and some are tricksters, others are shy. You wouldn't imagine that a world exists outside of the wall you and your community are forced to face, 
you'd think that the dolls projected onto the wall are indeed the real things they pretend to be. If the cave had an echo, you'd think that the things were talking to you as sentient beings. Truth, for you, would be nothing other than the shadows of those artifacts. This is where you're at right now. The wall and its images are the internet, social pressure, and the views you've never questioned. What would being released from your bonds and cured of that ignorance look like? Were you to suddenly be freed, you would stand up, turn around, walk up the path, and be pained and dazzled by the fire in the cave. Your eyes would gradually adjust and you'd finally see the puppets and the puppeteers. Even if someone were to tell you that these puppets were the true forms of the shadows you'd seen before, you wouldn't believe them. If someone told you to look at the fire, your eyes would hurt and you'd run back to what was familiar, the shadows on the wall. For someone to grab you and forcibly drag you up the path to the mouth of the cave, you would be agonized and irritated. The light of the sun would be so blinding that you wouldn't see a single thing, even though you were faced with the real world. Over time, you would adjust once more and see shadows, and then images, and then the things in front of you themselves. You'd see the stars at night best, as the light of day wouldn't be present. You'd reason that the sun provides the season and the years, governs everything in the visible world, and is the cause of all things that you could see. What if you were to remember your people, those you left behind? Wouldn't you pity them for their false knowledge and you'd count yourself lucky? If they had awarded each other praises or prizes for identifying the shadows or remembering facts about them, would you envy them at all? Would you rather work any job on the surface in the light of day than return to the fire, the wall, the cave, and the shadows? If you were suddenly taken back into the cave and forced into your old position, wouldn't your eyes simply see darkness? If you had to compete with the others in identifying the shadows as your eyes adjusted, wouldn't you struggle and be ridiculed? Wouldn't they say that this upward journey had been pointless? If you tried to free your community, wouldn't they kill you out of fear that their eyes and minds would deteriorate as far as yours seemingly had? This parable, known as Plato's Allegory of the Cave, is a classical demonstration of the journey from ignorance to enlightenment. While it's popular to show in contemporary media, I still find the original more profound than the recreations. There are two big lessons to learn from it for our purposes. It is the most beautiful thing to be able to see in the light of day, and nobody's going to drag you up the path to the cave's mouth. I can try to lead you, but you gotta rip the shackles off yourself. You're probably tempted to ask how you can do that. It's first important to understand the origin of the chains that are wrapped around your limbs and mind. Where did the ignorant darkness most of us find ourselves in come from? In Immanuel Kant's essay, What is Enlightenment?, he addresses the question of why adults languish in the cave. He labels the cave as a state of nonage, the inability to use one's own understanding without another's guidance. He says it's self-imposed, provided it's not from understanding, but from indecision and lack of courage. You now understand. It's time to be decisive and have courage. Kant says enlightenment can be summed up in the following words. Dare to know, have the courage to use your own understanding. Kant repeatedly attributes much of mankind's lack of progression past childhood ignorance to laziness and cowardice. He writes, if I have a book that thinks for me, a pastor who acts as my conscience, a physician who prescribes my diet and so on, then I have no need to exert myself. I have no need to think if I have the ability to pay. Kant posits that these people, those that you pay with consent, attention, and currency to entertain and think for you, intentionally nurture your ignorance in order to make you reliant on them. As a result, it's really hard to break free. You might, if we're honest, relish the safety, certainty, and comfort of your bondage. You may have nearly lost the ability to use your own understanding because you were never aware you could. It's wonderful to have a life framework, provided it was created from an informed thought process. Kant says that dogmas and formulas are marks of everlasting knowledge. To be willing to cast them off in pursuit of knowledge, 
truth and authenticity, whatever they may be, religious, political, or cultural mores, is terrifying because it's like a man unused to free movement jumping over the narrowest ditch possible. Kant says this is why there aren't many who emerge from the cave, from nonage, and walk firmly. It's terrifying to jump, to actively cultivate your mind. Now that we further understand the cave, the state of nonage, how do we climb or break out? Meister Eckhart, a 13th century German theologian, had some ideas. In On Detachment, Eckhart said that he had explored every avenue through which man could become one with God, those of pagans, those of Christians, and a large variety of others. I believe that by becoming one with God, he meant achieving enlightenment. The virtue he had found which enables this, detachment, was selected because it's free of all creatures, while most other virtues have some regard to external factors, people, and situations. He places disinterest, or detachment, above love, humility, and even compassion. His rationale was that God, or for us enlightenment, can only enter an empty space which has been prepared for it. Eckert wrote, I will be silent and hear what my God says within me, as if he were to say, if God wishes to speak to me, let him come into me, for I will not go out. He also wrote, if there's writing on a wax tablet already, one can't write on it. They have to erase or destroy the writing before starting their own project. Similarly, one's heart must be empty for enlightenment to occur. You must erase your tablet and cultivate silence within yourself. This is the first step. Become disinterested. Create a space in your mind. And only then can you pursue enlightenment properly and fill that space with true knowledge. You need to unplug. Try to limit your internet usage as much as possible, outside of useful activities in which you are employing the internet strictly and directly as a tool. The key here is to stop the constant inflow of information and entertainment so that there's a gap your consciousness can fill. You'll no longer be reacting constantly to input, but rather actively structuring your environment. Some people call this mindfulness. Plato would call it turning away from the wall lit up by the fire. Kant would call it jumping over the narrowest ditch. Eckhart would call it creating disinterest. You can call it whatever you want, but we are escaping the cave, leaving knowledge, and aiming for enlightenment, which is a more peaceful and fulfilling life. In the next few videos, we will explore different means of educating oneself. Thank you for watching and joining me on this journey.